Hey Legends, Blake here with another video and today should be a really exciting one because we're doing a full updated fishing tour. Let's jump straight into it. So to get started with the tour, I thought it's only fitting to start at the very top of the room. So here we have one of three racks that I built um, DIY. I would definitely recommend building DIY racks if you are setting up a fish room because nothing gets that custom fit quite like it. And at least if you build it yourself, you know that it'll last the test of time. The first tank I'm gonna talk about though is sort of uh, fish rack adjacent behind my head up there, but I couldn't kick off this tour with anything else but my beloved freshwater crabs. Now these crabs are freshwater Darwin um, crabs and by all reports they breed in full freshwater as well, which is really awesome. They get to a max size of six centimeters across the carapace, but for the Americans out there, that's probably a touch over two inches. So nothing too crazy. With that said, I would like to upgrade their tank from this three foot bookshelf aquarium, but there has been quite a bit of infighting and things like that. Really stoked to say that I've quite clearly got a dominant male and a female. So I'm definitely hoping to breed them in the future. But for now, I just really enjoy watching their quirky nature and watching them scuttle around the tank. That's always good fun. Moving along to the right now, more towards the tanks behind my head. Uh, the next sort of four tanks I'm gonna talk about as a group because that's really what they are. The next four tanks are used for Celestial Peldanio Grow Out. As you might know, I breed quite a few of these guys and sell to local shops and also ship them online occasionally. So there's just no way you'd be able to keep up the quantity and the demand for those to do a regular supply like that without at least five grow out tanks. Next to that is my Emerald Rasbora Grow Out Tank, which is the same principle, just one tank to start, a, start to grow out some fry. Those guys are extremely elusive though, so I've got minimal footage, uh, especially when a big black camera is in front of the tank. They just scuttle right to the back of the aquarium, but um, there's about 15 to 20 in there that I'm aware of. The next tank to that, this one here, has my male uh, Koi Half Moon Better. A beautiful male, and he's actually bred with a female that we'll look at shortly. However, they did actually eat all the eggs of that spawn, which is really disappointing. But you know, I'm conditioning them back up to full health and we'll give it another go. I'm really hoping to see another spawn from this beautiful guy here and my um, giant half moon better as well, which I guess is a decent enough segue to talk about her now. She is still recovering a little bit from the last breeding time, but she seems in good health. She's very active and both of them actually are eating really well and moving around the tank, um, showing good color. So I'm really happy with how they are. Um, Looking in between those two tanks are a uh, Endler tank, uh, Endless Live Barriers. These guys are, were sold as Redline Endless. There's so many different color forms of Endless that, you know, it's really dealer's choice of what you want to call them, but I'll stick with that naming convention for these guys. They've already had heaps of fry and uh, can't wait to see uh, them grow up and, and see how many males to females they get and so forth. But for now, really super simple tank put food in there, they multiply, sit back and enjoy. And the last tank down there, if you've seen the footage, you might be a bit confused as what is actually in there. But that is my blackworm culture. I do keep a live culture of blackworms because it's a great live food to feed my fish, conditions things up really, really well for breeding. And if anything's ever sick or looks a bit iffy, it's always good to just give them a nice feed of live blackworms I find, and that'll help them bounce right back. It's like chicken noodle soup if you're feeling a bit down in the dumps and it'll always cheer you right up. Let's move down now and we'll talk about some of the larger tanks on this side of the room. So the rest of the rack uh, is comprised of four three foot aquariums by 18 inches wide or 45 centimeters wide by 90 centimeters long. 
Um, I just think it's a really versatile size and I've got some Tanganyikans in these uh, tanks for the most part. So getting started behind my shoulder here, we have some Gelidochromus transcriptus, a really, really beautiful Gelidochromus species from Lake Tanganyika. I really like the colors that they get. They get a really nice blue sheen uh, to accompany their vertical bars. And these guys have been quite prolific in their breeding for me. Uh, up until recently, I kept them just as a colony in a two foot aquarium and they were producing really good volume. They didn't seem to bother their fry or anything. So I rewarded them by moving them up into this larger aquarium. Next door to them, I've got what are known as sardine cichlids or Cyprochromus leptosoma, Utinta. Um, there are quite a uh, number of Cyprochromus species, so Utinta uh, denotes where they actually come from as a collection point. These guys have a really beautiful purple body and the males get a yellow tail. They're usually quite active, but because there's only four in here, they're quite skittish. And again, it's really, really hard to get good B-roll on them. But if I can't do that, I'll put a photo up on the screen just to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they have bred for me before, but I had a bit of a disaster in the fry tank and it wiped them all out. So I'm hoping for another mouthful because these guys are uh, maternal mouth breeders and we'll start the whole process again. Down behind me here, I have a tank uh, with some discus in it and a few German blue rams. Obviously I keep this tank at about 31 degrees Celsius, which I believe is about 88 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, really, really enjoyed both discus and German blue rams, but I haven't had too much success with either species uh, over the long term. These ones are sort of my most uh, stable ones that I've ever kept. So I'm really uh, buoyed by that. I'm hoping that we can keep growing them out and get some really nice big dinner plate sized discus uh, and showing off some really nice color. Uh, mainly I favor the turquoise sort of coloration. So that's what we've gone with here. And then last but not least, I have some lemon cichlids. I have some Neolampologus leilupi, a beautiful rock dwelling cichlid, again from Lake Tanganyika. And you can see why they're called lemon cichlids. They have a beautiful lemon yellow color to them. They show some good activity and previously I had them in with the Cyprochromus. They didn't really bother each other too much, but mainly I just favor um, species only tanks and I hadn't seen any breeding out of the Lalupi. So I thought I'd move the Cyprochromus out and see if we'd get any spawns going. That was only recently, so I haven't had any just yet, but um, they do seem to be hanging around a lot of the caves. So hopefully sometime, sometime soon. So we'll keep heading around the room next and we'll go over to my fish bench, which is typically what you'd see if you were tuning into one of my live streams. Okay, so over here now at an area that I refer to as the fish bench. And this bench here is two layers high and I've got two foot aquariums um, placed long ways at the bottom and then just all of my odd shaped aquariums at the top. I deliberately did it this way so that I'd have an interesting background for live streaming and things like that. And I think it's also good not to do every um, fish rack uh, three layers high or all the way to the roof, just because the space can pretty quickly feel cluttered and you, you can start to not enjoy it so much. So having art and things on the wall, somewhere for my um, devil's ivy to grow big and lush, I think it's kind of a good thing that um, not everyone thinks about when planning their next fish room. So to get started, I've got my first of the two Fluval Flex Aquariums here. This is one that I picked up really cheap in a terrible state of uh, Facebook Marketplace. And it's been running like a dream. At the moment in there, I've got a uh, whiptail catfish, two Makalakai rainbow fish, which I recently got from Bodji from Australia, and my single male pea puffer, which is now up to about three years old. So that's a pretty good innings for a pea puffer. So I'm pretty happy with that. And he still looks nice and healthy. Um, the Makalakai Rainbows as well, I really like those guys, so I'll probably get a few more um, down the track. And I'll put them in one of the two foot aquariums and throw some mops in and things like that and probably try and breed some. When I got my initial um, 57 litre or 15 gallon Fluval Flex, I did say that it was my absolute favourite kit aquarium and I'd recommend it to any beginners. Since having this smaller one, I, don't, uh, it's, I think it's about 34 litres, which would probably be about eight gallons. Uh, I'd definitely recommend the larger one over this one, which I always suspected, but I just think it's a lot easier to manage 
algae, bioload, and things like that in the bigger 57 liter flex. As well as that, it's not that much more overbearing um, to the space. So I'd definitely say that uh, my statement that I made a few years ago now, that the Fluval Flex is my favorite uh, beginner kit aquarium to recommend, still rings true to this day. In the tank next to that, I have my Emerald Reservoir breeding group, although they don't breed um, that regularly or to a high level of quantity like I'd really like. I mean, just the same as I'm breeding the CPDs, I'd really love to be churning out plenty of Emerald Reservoirs because they're always really hard to get my hands onto and I always have heaps of people asking me for them. Uh, but when you do get eggs out of them, it's always a joy and hopefully one day we will churn out some real quantity. Uh, as for now, um, just a pretty standard breeding tank, nothing too crazy. There's a bit of a green tint from when I medicated it not too long ago. Um, I tried to drop some carbon in there to get that green tint out of here for the video. But now since we're sitting here, I'm sure some of you might be curious. This here is just a Wabi Kusa that I set up. Uh, it's a Bioscape Orb Terrarium and it uh, just has a light with a vent on the top. Really, really simple and I don't do anything with it really. I just have some aquatic plants in there like AR Mini, uh, Hygrophila Pinnatifida and a couple of couple of little Crip Parva plants. So um, just sort of, again, another little decorative piece that if I had wall-to-wall -wall aquariums, I wouldn't have anywhere to put something like that. The next tank along, I have my uh, CPD breeding colony number one. I have two breeding colonies of CPDs now to get that quantity that I do try and achieve. And uh, yeah, again, pretty simple aquarium, uh, bare bones for the most part, just a breeding contraption, one of my 3D printed breeding devices. I'll put a card up there above if you're not aware of what that is. Um, but yeah, I do make and sell on Etsy some breeding containers for uh, egg scattering fish like CPDs, um, some Tetras, some Resboros, Danios, those sorts of things. Um, again, there's just maybe about 20 adult CPDs in there and um, I keep it pretty simple. Harvest the eggs out, that's pretty much it. Take next to that, I have my established Fluval Flex 57 liter aquarium. And with that one, I've got a bunch of barbs in there. So I've got some ruby barbs and some five banded barbs in there. Uh, I initially put the five banded barbs in there, but they were super shy and I never actually saw them. So I put the ruby barbs in there and since I've done that, they've become a lot more outgoing. I don't know if it's just a species difference or what, but the ruby barbs certainly more social than the five bandits. The next tank along, I have my second Emerald Raspberry breeding tank. Again, pretty stock standard tank, pretty bare bones. Uh, it's definitely a breeding tank, not a display tank. And I uh, just keep it pretty simple, but um, yeah, I do enjoy still checking in on them. And it's kind of good at not having too many things in the way so that I can always maintain uh, good uh, healthy conditions for the fish as well. And the tank next to that, I have my glow light Danios or Chopro Danios, a really underrated species, I think. They get some beautiful fluorescent orange color to them. Uh, they are, again, a pretty shy fish, but um, yeah, they can sometimes come out to the front for food, but otherwise they just hang out at the back of the tank for the most part. And we'll keep moving down before we head to the bottom of the fish bench. Next to that, we have my planted Bioscape um, rimless aquarium. This has a, a weak aqua light on it, which I find to be really effective. I do put CO2 into this tank and I also have the Awaza Biomaster um, canister filter on this one. Uh, the plants just really take off in this tank all the time. And then I do a massive cutback and sort of expect it not to grow back as effectively, but it always does. So I'm really, really happy with this aquarium. For stocking, I just have a bunch of uh, redfin danios, which again, I think provide nice color and activity, but sometimes it is hard to see them in all the foliage. Um, but when you do, it's definitely a bit of a blessing. Okay, so heading down on the bench now and we'll work our way back towards us. Uh, we'll get started with my Gardener Eye Killifish. Uh, just a pair of Gardener Eyes and they have had some fry for me, which I'll show you later on in the video. Uh, but Gardener Eye, I reckon, are supremely beautiful killifish, uh, not an annual killifish, like some people get a bit nervous keeping killies because they think they're going to die off after a year. Not the case with the two that I'm going to show you um, now and, and next. Uh, the garden has beautiful red spots, um, blue sheens to them, fantastic coloration. The female, not so much, but um, 
keep a tight lid anytime you're keeping a top dwelling fish like these guys and you'll have a lot of success and um yeah great little fish to keep next to them a bit bigger but um, definitely chock full of color once again i have my golden wonder pan chucks. these are a fish that i've kept for years and years now um, not these particular ones but um, on and off i've kept the species for quite a while quite easy to breed with the spawning mop which is probably why i keep coming back to them and a bit unusual like they're not at every fish saw that you come across so when people do see them they generally are a bit intrigued and uh, because they are so easy to breed you know i often hand around some eggs or mops or what have you and uh, and they're just a fun species like that really easy to feed but once again if you don't have a tight fitting lid they will sail right out the top of the tank so do keep that in mind in the tank next to that i've got another tang and yeekin species i have my gold oscillatus shell dwellers so these are the uh, Lampologus Ocellatus Golds, quite a lot more aggressive than Maltese, which are sort of the, the standard shell dwellers, but um, you do get a nice canary yellow color with some blue sheens to the mouse. Um, pretty well untexable until you've seen them actually breed, but um, yeah, just a fantastic little fish. Uh, I really enjoy the behavior always with shellies and interacting with the different shells. In my case, I've got escargot shells in the tank, bit of sand and they'll go and landscape it themselves and um, yeah simple to feed they'll raise their own fry as well so really great little fish again if you are okay with not keeping plants because they will shred up any plants you put in there um, other than that fantastic species to keep next tank over i have my stir by corridors just a little group i picked up a couple months ago of about 10 stir -bys. Really like the patterning and the coloration, especially those orange um, pectoral fins. So I can't wait to hopefully breed these guys. I'm keeping the tank pretty low key. Um, I think I will probably put some sand in there just to get that more uh, natural behavior out of the quarries as they shuffle through the sand. But other than that, um, yeah, I'll just keep it pretty easy to maintain and pretty easy to keep an eye out for any eggs if they do appear. Next tank over, I've got my Epistogramma Cacatoides. Just a few, um, actually I think I sold off all the colony and I just kept a couple of random fry which I didn't notice and now these are the adults from them. But uh, nevertheless, they're sort of a species that you can't just detach yourself from. I still have to keep uh, Epistos in some form or another in the fish room. Uh, it kind of goes in waves. I'll, one day I'll go Episto mad and half the tanks in here will have Epistos and then another time it'll be like now where we'll just have sort of the leftovers from various species that I have kept and bred. But um, Cacatoides are a staple for a reason. Some beautiful uh, orange flame-like finish and um, yeah, some pretty peaceful temperament for the most part. So um, yeah. Moving on, we've got my fry grow outs from the two Gelatochromus species, uh, one of which I haven't mentioned here yet, so that will come. But we've got the Gelatochromus dickfeldi first and the Gelatochromus transcriptus second. Yeah, so both of which I kept in these two foot aquariums, both of which uh, were quite prolific with the amount of fry that they had. So I decided to move the males out, uh, to, to move the adults out and leave the fry to grow out um, in possibly less hostile conditions, although they did leave them alone for the most part. So um, in any case, I thought they'd grow out a bit quicker if they weren't competing for food. And that way I can target feed them a bit easier with baby brine shrimp and, and so, so forth. And then the last tank over, I just have a bristlenose tank. It is always handy to have bristlenose on hand and um, yeah, they just easily breed in there. So uh, always just have a, have a few little uh, bristlenose in there and, and um, yeah, whether people want them or uh, whether I need just some extra help uh, cleaning the glass on some of these aquariums, then the bristlenos get to work and um, when they're not needed, then they go in there and they live out a happy life. And, um, and that's pretty much the story with those guys. Okay, let's head back there and check out their next rack of aquariums. Okay, so before we go through everything that's on this rack to my right, there is just two three foot aquariums on a rack here to my left. Uh, really, really straightforward. On the top is my second CPD uh, breeding tank. Again, bare bones setup, a bit of moss and my 3D printed breeding contraption. A bit of pothos out the top just to help with some nitrates. 
But other than that, super, super simple. That said, it is really great that my desk is right next to that aquarium. So I get plenty of eyeball time checking in on those adult CPDs, which is really why I started breeding them in the first place. Below that, I have a really cool mix of fish, I think as well. Super underrated in my opinion are the blue-eyed cichlid. They're actually sort of a cousin of convict cichlids, but they have a brilliant blue um, luminescent eye and their finnage gets really nice uh, sh shades of blues and oranges as well. So you get kind of the benefits of convicts in terms of that color, but on sort of a matte gray brown background, which I really appreciate. Uh, they do have some semi-aggressive tendencies, but definitely not as bad as convicts either. And I'm even keeping them in a planter tank, albeit just with some Valisteria, so super hardy plants. I also left in, by accident actually, some baby platies because that tank used to be full of uh, sunset platies and I sold them all off, or at least I thought that I did, and they didn't even eat the baby uh, platies, so they've just grown up in there with them, which I've been surprised about, but um, this is kind of fish keeping. It's fun to experiment with things like that. Okay, now let's jump over here to the four foot rack. So all up above, there's a whole bunch of 20 liter aquariums, but the main um, guts of this tank, I guess, are four uh, 75 gallon tanks. So let's talk about what's inside those. So the first tank here behind me has my Senegal Bashirs, three of those guys, and I absolutely love them. They're so weird, so derpy, and um, yeah, just really, really fun to watch. Uh, they might sort of be a beige color, and they might not have much patterning, but they're really, really weird to me. I don't know whether it's because they're similar to sort of crocodiles or their prehistoric nature or the really interesting history behind them. But I really love these guys and it's definitely got me hooked on the Bashir train. I'm just waiting to hit the lottery before I go in deep on all the other species that there are. I do keep them in a planter tank as well, although I wouldn't recommend keeping them with anything too fine leaved. And they do occasionally dig things up here and there, but for the most part, they just seem to enjoy swimming through all the foliage. They don't seem to rip at it at all. So just clumsiness, but um, yeah, nothing on purpose from what I've observed anyway. Next tank to that has my tricolor sword tails or uh, Sun K sword tails in there. Sorry for the footage of this one. The light on there is at a weird frequency. I've tried to play around with the camera settings and I can't get rid of that flicker. So uh, apologies for that. But the sword tails themselves do have some really interesting coloring and patterning. And again, I think sword tails are often overlooked. They do get a bit bigger than platies or guppies, I guess. So they're less versatile in terms of what size tank you can keep them in. But a beautiful big four foot aquarium, chock full of uh, sword tails, I think, can look really, really great. And uh, definitely plant safe. And this tank does get CO2 uh, as well. So uh, it's just, again, a really enjoyable tank to watch. Now down below the Bashir tank, I have my Neolamprologus multifasciatus, sort of the classic shell dweller from Lake Tanganyika. Um, again, not bursting with color or anything like that, but it's really cool to watch them interact with the substrate and the shells. And they do have a beautiful blue eye as well. Uh, really, really peaceful. They don't even mess with each other's fry or anything like that. Uh, although they, I would say that they've been more prolific in smaller tanks than this one here, which is the opposite of what I thought would happen. I thought I'd move them into this bigger tank and then sort of the population would explode, but um, it hasn't been the case for me. Next door to them, down the bottom, I've got the other species of Gelidochromus that I keep, the Gelidochromus dickfeldi. And again, really peaceful, not gonna mess with fry or anything like that. Um, they're more of a rock dweller, but there was already a whole bunch of shells in that aquarium, so they can interact with those as well. And I thought that at least the babies might go and hide in a shell or whatever. Um, again, they're sort of gonna mess with all the sand and do all that fun stuff that uh, is really good about Lake Tanganyikans. But other than that, you get a beautiful, uh, a beautiful, peaceful cichlid, horizontal barring on those guys, but you still get some nice uh, blue sheens as well and, uh, and other great species to watch. 
Now up along the top here, the first six aquariums are all shrimp tanks. So I set them up. If they're a dark color shrimp, I put them on sand. If they're a light color shrimp, I put them on um, master soil or ADA Amazonia. We've got some simple mosses and a sponge filter. And that's pretty much it. The colors of cherry shrimp that I keep are yellow, uh, red, blue, and black. And the colors of uh, caradine shrimp that I keep are snow white, crystal black, crystal red, and that's it except for some blue bolts which I have in a small tank inside. Then there are three tanks in between that um, don't really have anything in there. They're mainly things like for quarantine or treating one specific uh, ill fish or maybe hatching out some eggs and things like that. Kind of just spare tanks that I just keep full of water in case I need them on that rainy day. And the next tank to them, I have the blonde versions of the Redline Endlers that I showed before. Um, I just liked both, so I couldn't decide which one to keep. I had a spare tank, so I thought, let's just get both. Um, so yeah, I've got the blonde and the standard version of the Redline Endlers, which I also like, and they're also breeding in there as well. And then the tank next to that, I have the fry from my Gardener Achilles, uh, which are growing out. So uh, again, super simple setup and um, just enjoying watching the baby garden rise grow up. Now we're through the sort of rack component of this fish room tour. So if you are enjoying it, please hit subscribe and hit like, it will really help me out. And it helps all the YouTube algorithms to send this out to other people that might enjoy this kind of content. So let's move on and check out my African butterfly fish tank. So it's a bit of an interesting turn of events, but this side of the fish room actually used to be the most neglected, but in some ways it's probably now the most exciting. Uh, in this little three foot tank here, I've got six of my, six or seven of my African butterfly fish. I thought they're a really quirky fish that are again, often overlooked. So I've been really working hard to try and condition these guys up for breeding, teaching myself about uh, the different sexing techniques and trying to work out if I've got males and females. And um, yeah, hopefully one day I can breed these guys. Nothing yet, but uh, definitely we'll be focusing on them shortly. And then <laughs> you've probably been distracted the entire time I've been talking, but behind that, I've got my eight by two by two aquarium that I just recently got and set up uh, with a whole bunch of rainbow fish, some clown loaches, some uh, manakaparu angelfish, and some red-breasted acaras, which I think is a mix that's really, really interesting and sort of natural, but also striking in the same way. I've really, really enjoyed the activity that uh, that tank has, has shown, and um, it's really cool to have a tank that big. Now, of course, I've got a heap of driftwood in this aquarium, so it is tannin central at the moment, but that will clear up in time. And at the bare minimum, it's a great antibacterial for the fish that are in here. In terms of the fish, a lot of them came from all fish to you. And you can also use my code Blake10 to get 10% off. I get absolutely no kickbacks from that. Uh, they're just my go-to for ordering fish online. And a lot of people do ask where I do order them from. I was lucky enough that the Goida River rainbows did come from a local breeder who actually lives about 10 minutes from me. So I went there and checked out his setup. And um, yeah, if you, I think it'd be really cool. I might try and tee up a fish room tour at his house uh, in the coming um, months or weeks. So stay tuned for that. Other than that, I've just planted it out with a bunch of easy plants, crypts and swords and that sort of thing. And just to kickstart everything, especially while the lighting is a bit limited from these tannins, I have got some CO2 going on this tank as well, just to make sure everything settles in really nice and easy. So now that we've seen the eight foot, before we go and see my other two larger aquariums, let's tick off these last four two foot aquariums that you can just see over my shoulder. I'll run you through what's in those. Okay, so over here we have some larger uh, two foot aquariums. These ones are 45 centimeters high or 18 inches high. Uh, starting from left to right, the first one's got two axolotls in it. If you're not aware, I actually heat the room in here and I can already hear people wondering how I keep axolotls in a tropical temperature room. Now I do that because I've actually got a couple of fans in the back there and uh, the evaporative cooling on that, as you can see, the water level of that tank is quite low, but it does actually cool the water really effectively. Uh, I tested it for um, a long time actually before I put 
anything in there because I always want to make sure that the livestock are going to live safely and effectively uh, whenever I want to go and get something. And um, I check the temperature and it regularly stays around about 22 or 23 degrees Celsius, which is spot on for axolotl. So I was really lucky there. But um, we just got two Dymax fans in the back. Um, the axolotls, they hang out uh, in the pot for a lot of the time. And I know that two axolotls, especially young ones, is often dangerous to keep as well, but they've never shown any signs of aggression. And they did come from the same uh, tank at the shop too. So I'm sure they've grown up uh, since a very, very young age together. Uh, but my kids absolutely love those guys. So they'll be hanging around for the long term. Tank next to that, I have my red Molero uh, Trophius, beautiful species of Trophius. And they have got some fry in there as well, which was a big surprise to me. I uh, really, really love them. They're, they do hide a lot of the time behind the rocks, but um, I've found them to be a pretty easy species to keep, to be honest, and haven't had too many issues with them. Next to that, I've got my blue jewel cichlids. Jewels are a West African cichlid, so uh, they're African, but they can be kept in sort of normal Amazonian uh, conditions. And they're quite aggressive as well, I'd say on par with, with convict cichlids. So do be mindful of that, but you do get beautiful, beautiful coloration with those guys and um, heaps of activity as well. And then in the tank next over, I just have my colony of peppermint bristlenose. It's been quiet on all fronts for those guys for quite a while. They just hang out in their, in their huts and I'll probably look at moving them on pretty soon. But um, yeah, I've bred them a few times now and, and uh, it might be time to move on to something else. So let's check out the last two big forefoots and uh, wrap this video up. Okay, so the first cab off the ranks is this here, 4x2x2 two two aquarium with some blue sapphire angels, a whole bunch of rainbow fish. Uh, we've got turquoise, we've got red Erian rainbows, we've got bozeman eyes, of course, and uh, we've got some giant danios and a purple spotted gudgeon right there. Beautiful, beautiful tank. Unfortunately, with the location that it is in the room, probably don't spend as much time looking into it as I should, but every time I come over here, I'm always... Uh, really happy with the level of activity. Um, in terms of smaller fish, we've also got some Corydoras hanging around the bottom. We've got some uh, rosy tetras as well, and it's just a good time. Um, you can't really go wrong with the tank of this profile, and it's kind of what inspired me to do it on a larger scale in the eight foot in the end. So there we go, we've got one more tank to go, and I've definitely saved the biggest for last, at least in terms of fish. Okay, and here we have, last but not least, my 4x3x2 aquarium with my Saratoga Lycardi, an Australian native species, and there's four Oscars in there. Unfortunately, the Saratoga is on a bit of an aggression spree at the moment and has all of the Oscars pinned up into the back corner. Uh, he's trying to get them as we speak. I've tried rearranging this tank uh, to sort of break up any territories, but I think unfortunately he's decided the whole footprint is his. So I'm going to probably have to come up with the plan B for the Oscars, uh, whether I move a pair into one of the 75 gallons or um, clear out the 4x2 and move them in there. Um, it's just not really fair on them to have them pinned up in the corner 24-7. So um, unfortunately, it looks like that combination isn't going to work anymore. But aggression aside, he, he or she is an absolute beauty of a fish, one that I've kept since, you know, he was about that big. And uh, yeah, I definitely think that if he was left to his own devices in a tank this size, it would be an entirely appropriate size for a fish like this. I particularly like the three foot depth on it, allows him to turn around really, really easily. And um, yeah, overall, I'd prefer it to be a bit longer, but, um, but I'm entirely comfortable with, uh, this uh, housing option for him. So there you go guys, that's it for another full fish room tour from me, Blake from Blake's Aquatics. If you liked it, let me know down below what your favorite tank was, or if you've got a species that I just have to keep and <laughs> include in the next tour, then let me know that as well. Um, thanks also to Aquarium Universe, my channel sponsor. If you want 10% off all of the aquarium goods you could think about and you live in Australia, they have a website that stocks absolutely everything. And my code is down below if you want to do that. Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.